This morning we're going to do something a little different than our normal routine. See, normally, well, we go through books of the Bible. So right now on Sundays we're in the book of Ephesians. And so we just kind of go through a paragraph or two or a chapter. And then the next week we continue on right where we were in that book. Today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we are going to open our Bibles. That's a good thing. If you're ever somewhere and it's supposed to be a church and they don't open their Bibles, that's kind of a clue that, hmm, I'm not sure about this place. right? If the Bible isn't talked about, if Jesus isn't glorified, and they say, you can just leave your Bible at home, oh, that's not a good sign. So we're going to say, open your Bibles to several places. You can put a finger in Acts chapter 2. You could put a finger in Matthew 16, or you could just follow along as we go. Because we're going to study God's Word, not kind of sequentially, paragraph or line by line like normal, but more of a topical theme today. The good thing that as we study God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, is we cover all the topics. All the themes get covered. It's a pretty amazing, even ones you don't want to talk about, they get covered. Uh, and so we find that's the best way for us to learn and grow. If God's given it to us, we should probably teach it. We should probably jump into it. So we're going to do that again here this morning. This morning we're going to talk about the church. What is it? Why is the church the plan of God? And maybe when you hear the word church, you have all kinds of things come to mind. Maybe you've had bad experiences in the church. I won't ask you to raise your hand. And so you have just something within you that is pushing against this idea of the church. You just think, oh, it's bureaucracy. It's just, you want our money. And, you know, all the, you have bad image of the church. Maybe you've had really good experiences with the church. And so you're like, yes, I'll talk about the church. That's great. I love it. Uh, wherever you're at, maybe you have no clue what the church is supposed to be what it's supposed to be all about. Hopefully we can answer some of those questions here this morning. Start with a definition. Church, what is it? Well, it's a building. No, see, that's where we've got it all wrong. It's not a building. We're the church right now. They're like, there's no building. How can we be the church? Because the church is not a building. That's a good thing. The church is the assembly, the congregation, the called out ones who gather together under Jesus' name. It's only used a couple times in the Gospels, but it's a phrase, it's a term that Paul uses in a local sense, a regional sense, and a universal sense. So you can have a local church, you can have a regional type church, and there's the universal church. Oh. It's a place where we gather to hear teaching, to fellowship, to care for one another, to worship God, to be equipped. We're going to go through some of these things this morning. Did the church start in the Old Testament? You're like, there's an Old Testament? Yes. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament in the Bible. The Old Testament has 39 books. It largely covers the history of Israel and God's plan to send the Messiah who comes in the New Testament. That's Jesus. And no, the church is not in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was filled with the nation of Israel, and they had gathered as an assembly, same word, but different context. The actual church didn't come into being until the New Testament. It wasn't supposed to be just a Jewish thing. It's a everyone thing. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that whosoever, that's anyone, everyone, that believes may have eternal life. Everyone can believe. Anyone can, you don't have to be part of a certain club or group or nationality. You don't have to have a certain amount of money. It just It's open sesame to Jesus. So where does the church fit into all that? Well, the first place we're going to look is Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus is speaking to Peter. He had just asked the question, who do people say that I am? You know, he wants to get some feedback from the disciples. And so they're all kind of like, oh, one of the prophets. And then Peter, and if you know the story of the Bible, you know what's happening a little bit. You know that Peter is one who's quick to jump. He's quick to give a, an answer, and it's not always the right answer. Sometimes you're like, oh, Peter. Uh, 
But in this case, he gives the right answer. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so then Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, And I tell you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. On what rock? Well, there are some who believe that rock is Peter, that the church is built on Peter. I disagree. I think biblically we should disagree because if the church is built on a person, that's kind of not a very solid foundation. If the church is built on a personality or a person, no matter how great and grand they are, that has potential for disaster. The church is built not on Peter, but on Peter's statement on this rock. What rock? This statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The foundation of the church is Jesus, which makes a lot of sense. If the foundation was on one of us, it'd be kind of suspect. It'd be kind of shaky. But the foundation of the church is Jesus. That makes all the difference. In other words, it's not just another club. It's not just another organization to belong to. This is something supernatural. This is something of God. That puts it in a different category than if it's something of man. Jesus says, I will build my church. They're like, uh, well, do you know that Jesus went back to heaven? I, I do know that, yeah. Uh, how is he building his church if he's in heaven? Well, he left people on earth to do the work, and he left them the Holy Spirit to live within Christians. And so the work of the church is Jesus' job to build it, to add, to bring you here today. You're like, well, I was here because of an invitation. I was here because of Facebook. I was here because someone invited me. I was here because I had nothing else to do. Well, you're here because Jesus brought you here. Why? Because Jesus is building his church, little by little. You're like, huh, that's kind of tricky. Yeah, he does that. If it's left to us, well, again, we could do it. There's ways to kind of get people into a, right? We could have done more advertising. We could have gone out on radio. We could have gone door to door. We could have, you know, tried to do a fancy campaign. We could have had a fireworks show in the day. That'd be interesting. Maybe not so good. Uh, we could have done all kinds of other things to what? Draw people because we're going to build it. We're going to do it, right? But what about next week? Well, then next week when you come, we're going to do something even more special because you're expecting amazing and Maybe it's not amazing all the time. Oh. So we're going to leave the building of the church to Jesus. Now, he's going to work through us. We're going to do our part. But the ultimate responsibility for the building of the church is not on the pastor. Whew. What we're going to be looking in Ephesians next week, it's actually on the people. Inspired and equipped by the church to work with Jesus to reach the world. Oh, that's cool. The other thing that he says is the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nothing, no one can stop the work of the movement that Jesus began, the church. The gates of hell, you're like, I don't even know if I believe in hell. There's a hell. There's a Satan. It's real. He's real. And Jesus is declaring it. Hey, not even the gates of hell shall prevail. No one, no way, no how can stop the work of the church from going forward. Why? Because it's built on Jesus. Jesus is building the church. So he's going to draw people. He's going to convict. He's going to change lives, transform us to be more like him. Many have tried to stop the church. Right? Over the years, people have tried to burn Bibles and destroy the church and communist places and all around the world. There's persecution of Christians. Why? Because they don't want that message going forward. But you know what? In those places, for example, China, in the 50s when the missionaries were kicked out and the communists came in, there was less than 50,000 Christians in all of China. Today, they're not really sure. 50 million, 100 million Christians... They're not exactly sure, but they know the number is huge. You're like, how is that possible? I thought it's illegal. Yeah. They have some churches that are part of the government, but then there's an underground church movement that is just spreading, and no one can stop it. Why? Because Jesus is building his church.
So when did the church actually start? Well, this church started 11 years ago. Oh, you mean the full, the, the big church, yeah. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is when the church started. Acts is the first book after the Gospels. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels, and then the book of Acts. And that's, it's basically history. The history of the church, and it's beginning. They're like, I don't know if I like history. It's kind of exciting. In Acts chapter 2, they were all gathered together. The Holy Spirit comes down, and people are like, what is going on? This is crazy. And what does Peter do? He gets up, and he preaches. He heralds, he explains, and proclaims six ways to have a happy life. Three ways to have a better wife. <laughs> no, no, no. He proclaims and exclaims Jesus. He takes the scriptures and says, this is that. Turn with me in Acts chapter 2 if you have your Bibles. We're going to read a little bit. We'll start in verse 22 so we can get a little bit of the idea of what his sermon was all about. He's speaking primarily at that time to Jewish people. And so he's trying to relate to them, this is what's happened and it's related to what the prophets have said. Verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. He is at the right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also would dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you make, known, make me full of gladness with your presence. He goes on to tell him that, well, David died. You can go visit his tomb, but Jesus is risen. Verse 32 and exalt it. And then verse 34, he says, David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? He says, Hey, Everything that's going on has been foretold by the prophets. It's not a surprise to us. Jesus has come. He's fulfilled prophecy. Hundreds of prophecies, by the way. And so he said, this is that which was written. And that's a great way to kind of understand some of the things about God. If you can tie it to Scripture, that's a good thing. And that's what Peter does. And what happens when they hear about Jesus, that he lived, he died, was buried, and rose again? They were cut to the heart. What are we supposed to do with that? Peter's like, I don't know. No, he, he had a plan. He says, what? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you hear about Jesus, that he loves you, that he died for you, the response is to repent, to turn from sin and turn to Jesus and believe that he's the Christ and your Lord and Savior and he will rescue you, he will redeem you, he will take you from death to life. Verse 41, those who received his word were baptized. We're going to have a baptism after. If you've never been baptized, that's something you should do. It's a command of Jesus. And there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. The church started with a bang. 3,000 people. You're like, that's a big church. Yeah. 3,000 people added to the church. Boom. There we go. We've got a mega church. You're like, I don't know if I don't like big churches. It's in the Bible. <laughs> what did this big church do? Well, glad you asked. They did four things. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Let's just quickly talk about these things. They talked about, they had teaching. The apostles were teaching. What were they teaching? Well, like Peter's sermon in chapter 2 of Acts, they were teaching the Bible. That seems to make sense. 
Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8 is a good example of this. It says, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's what we do week in, week out. When you come to Calvary Chapel, you will hear the Bible being read. You will hear it explained so that it makes sense. But if you just leave it there, you go, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I feel much better. That's not enough. James says this in chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So as we go through the Bible and we say, here's what it means, here's what it says, here's what God's speaking to us today, now we need to apply it to our lives and go, eh, I'm not sure about that part. Why? Because that part involves us surrendering or obeying or putting away something that we really like doing. And God's saying, yeah, you need to stop that. Oh, I like it. Okay, well. Ask again next week and the week after. He's very patient. And so we explain and give the sense of the scripture and then we apply it to our lives. That's what they were all about. They were teaching God's word. And so whether you make this your church home or you're from another church, if that's not happening, ask your pastor, how come you're not teaching us the Bible? We were on vacation just recently. We went to my parents' church and you know, it's a little different than ours, and so we asked our kids, well, what did you think? And, and our middle son's like, it's just different. You know, and so we're like probing and, you know, agging him on. Well, what do you mean different? You know, we knew what we were looking for. We were trying to see if he knew what we were looking for. Uh, he was like, well, they talked about the Bible, but they didn't go through the Bible. They didn't really explain the Bible, and it, it was good, but it, it just, he was used to just hearing the Bible explained. That's what he thought was normal. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Why? Because if you go a lot of places, they'll do this every week, which I'm doing right now, a topical message. So today we're talking about the church. Next week I'm going to talk about grace. The week after I'm going to talk about having a happy family. Next week I'm going to talk. And, and those are all good things, right? But what you end up doing is what I'm doing today is you're pulling a scripture from here, a scripture from there, and it's still scripture, so that's good. But you're not explaining what's really happening around those scriptures. And so you're feeling like this is a bunch of things for me to do. This is a bunch of more ways that I'm failing. And so now they're telling me I need to be a better husband, a better dad, a better mom. And, you know, and that could get kind of burdensome. And so rather than that, we kind of go with the method that the Bible says or they're teaching the Bible. And we allow God then to bring up the topics from week to week and the theme that we uncover there in the text. And what does that do? We understand that Paul, maybe like when we're in Ephesians, Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. So we understand what the context is and the bigger picture of his letter and why he's writing it. And so as we read a sentence, we understand, well, that's not just separate from here. He's telling us to do this, but that's after he said, here's who God is. Here's who Jesus is. And so because of that, now you do this. Oh, see, when we often just go to this, here's what you need to do. Here's how you behave. It feels like a lot of rules and you feel like, well, I know I used to. I can't measure up. And I don't understand why I'm supposed to do those things. I know I'm supposed to be better. I'm supposed to do better, but I don't get how. Well, that's why we go through and we teach all of God's word. And it allows us to infiltrate. And the more you hear God's word, the more it's just in you. And it'll come out of you. And that's going to be a good thing. So they did teaching. In fact, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, it says people are going to not preach God's word in the future. You should. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, preach the word. Don't preach a, a book. Don't preach a, a, a cool thing, an idea. Preach the word. I mean, in case you've never held the Bible, this is a smaller one, but they're, they're fairly big, right? There's a lot there to preach. If you run out of that, you do it again. Because it's going to take you a lot of years to get through all of this. Oh. I never have a problem. What am I going to preach this week? Oh, I got the Bible. I got so much information. I have to hold it back. I could go on and on, but I won't. It's okay. <laughs> the second thing they were involved with was fellowship. That's a word we don't really use. It means communion, sharing life together in common, having things in common. Hmm. 
One commentator said it this way, the expression of genuine Christianity among the members of God's family. It includes, someone said, at its heart, love and acceptance. Ephesians 3, 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the root of fellowship, is you have the love of God living within you, and you bring that to someone else, you share something with something, and it's sharing of something with someone. It's accepting of one another. It's like, you would never get the group of people in a church together if it wasn't a church, right? If you belong to a certain club, well, there's a certain kind of person you have to be to be in that club, generally, right? If it's, a, you know, the tennis club or a golf club or, a, you know, some kind of service club, there's some kind of requirements and you got to pass a test or you got to have a fee or something. But the church, because it's open for everybody, you get people in there that go, I've never hang out with him, but you're a brother, you're a sister. Wow, this is cool. And you can, you can go anywhere in the world, walk into a church, and feel home. You won't understand a word. You'll be like, this is interesting. But you'll understand what? They're, they're worshiping Jesus, and they'll welcome you, and they'll love you, and you'll be like, man, this is amazing. These people love me. They don't even know me. Why do they do that? Because that's fellowship. Some people joke that fellowship is like coffee and cake and, you know, did you have good fellowship? How much food did you eat? You know. No, that often helps the fellowship, right? It, it often helps to have a meal or to have coffee together. And so we're going to have some hot dogs. It's not the, you know, gourmet kind of food, but, you know, it'll do. Uh, we got cotton candy. We got snow cones. Why? Because we want you to hang out and to talk with people. And that's fellowship. We're to esteem one another. That's part of fellowship. Thinking highly of one another. Someone said that would solve about 95% of problems that come up. If we would just esteem others more than ourselves. If we would think of others more than ourselves, most of our problems would go away. His example is Christ in Philippians chapter 2, where he humbled himself. And if we would do that regularly, that would change how we interact with one another. Because someone says, you know, well, I don't go to that church anymore. Why? Well, because I don't like those people anymore. Oh, so welcome to ours. I'm sure they'll be within six months someone you don't like. So uh, where will you be going next? Why? Because where there's people, there's going to be conflict. Ah, I bet you there's conflict at your house. You're like, oh, no, we're perfect. Can we come and visit in your glass house? Because <laughs> that's probably not true. Right? Because you're people... And guess what? At the root of all people is sin. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you think you're joining a perfect church, don't do it because you'll wreck it. There's no perfect church. But as we esteem others, we think about others more than ourselves. That fellowship, that thinking of others more than ourselves does something. It helps us. We grow together with, well, the Bible calls it agape love. It's this kind of self sacrificial love that God has for us. It's in the Greek, they had different kinds of love. They had a friendship love, a sexual love, and then they had agape love. And that was one that wasn't really used, but God grabs it and Jesus demonstrated and the apostles talked about it, that that's the kind of love that God has for us, unconditional. That's the kind of love we're to give and to have for one another. Really, it's family. And whether your church is small or 3,000, the fellowship of the family in Christ, the church, is what we're to be all about. See, one pastor said this, people recommend their favorite restaurant, their favorite movies, all the time. But culture says, don't talk about Jesus. But when it comes to our faith in Jesus, we have to push past the hesitancy to talk about our faith and care enough about people to share about Jesus. If you just make it natural, just make it natural. Thank you. If we make it part of our lives, it doesn't become something weird. And fellowship is part of that. They also were breaking bread. You're like, I like that part. Yes, uh, me too. Uh, we do that every Wednesday, actually. Before we have our worship in Bible study on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock you can come, there will be food. Woo! 
Uh, but it also refers to communion. Communion? What's that? We don't have a lot of time, but that is where we remember the Lord's death, Jesus' death on the cross. And so we have a little wafer and we have a little juice. We remember his broken body and his shed blood for our sins. And we could do that together. We can do that in homes. It used to be back in the day, you know, after church, people would go to people's homes. That was a thing, right? It rarely happens today. But it's exciting when it does. When someone invites you to their home and they have prepared food for you, you don't say no. You say, what time should I be there? Right? That's amazing. Breaking of bread. Prayer was the other thing they were involved with. We've prayed a few times throughout this service already. And we'll pray again. On Wednesday nights, we have something called 10 minutes of prayer. After we sing a few songs, we break up into small groups. And we have a theme where we pray and we mix up kids, youth, and adults in little groups. And to hear these little kids pray. They're like, are they like on point? Yeah, it's amazing. And it becomes normal as we pray one for another and for people around the world. Starting this summer, we're going to be praying for the other churches in Port Angeles. By name, each week, a different church. That's kind of cool. That's what they were all about. So that's the church. That's what they were doing. They had fellowship. A couple times we see in the book of Acts where this all kind of plays out. In chapter 12, Peter was thrown in jail. And it says in verse 5 that the church was praying. It wasn't just what they did in Acts chapter 2. It was part of their regular life. They're praying for people, praying for needs, praying for things that are going on in our lives. There's nothing too small and there's nothing too big that we shouldn't be praying one for another. Now maybe you're thinking, oh, that sounds like a good church, but here's the thing, you know, the reason I don't like the church, the reason I, I, I used to, you know how many people used to go to church? I, I meet people all the time over these last 11 years here in Port Angeles. We could have a 3,000 people church if all the used tos actually went to church, right? Why? Because, well, I used to go, but now I don't. Why? Well, because, and they got all kinds of reasons, and if you've got reasons, sit down and talk with somebody. Walk through those, because it's not about the people, it's about Jesus. If you're going to church about the people, and, and that's what's where your focus is, then you've got the wrong focus. The focus is supposed to be Jesus. Well, the other thing that people say is, well, I don't, I don't go to church because there's too much judging. You're just very judging. <laughs> judge, judge, judge. Oh, I got a verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges the outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Wait, what? We are to judge? Uh-oh. Now, Jesus talked about this a little bit, and that's probably where you've heard the don't judge, but... The idea that Jesus had and that Paul has also in other places is we don't judge someone eternally, right? I don't have that power. The church doesn't have that power. The Pope doesn't have that power. Nobody has that power but Jesus to send someone to be separated from God forever. That's his deal. He judges hearts and minds. What does it mean then we're to judge those within the church? Well, there's some things that the church is supposed to be characterized by. Now, it starts where we come and maybe you don't know anything and you're just learning and you're growing. That's great. But over time, as you start to learn about Jesus, your life gets transformed and changed. Now there's a change in not just what you believe, but how you think and live and what you say. It's called holiness. It's supposed to happen. You're supposed to change. Like, well, what if I don't? Well, then we get to judge you. You're like, what? No, we get to challenge you and say, hey, the way you're living, it, you, you say you believe in God. Yeah, I do. Well, then why do you keep doing this? God says it's not good for you. Well, I just want to do it. Okay, well, we got a problem. And so we help one another. And that's hard, right? Everyone wants you to just say, hey, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, how about you? Doing good, too. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've had the worst week of your life, and you've got this secret sin that you don't tell anybody about. And why? Because you don't want them to judge you. Like, but if you share it with someone... You don't share with everybody, right? There's some things you shouldn't share with everybody. Some people share too much, right? It's like a Facebook thing. 
Instagram, your whole lives, everything's on, you know, stop sharing some of those things. But if you have some people in the church that you can share with that will ask you the hard questions, hey, what about this in your life? What's going on here? You have that opportunity then to minister to them, to help them, and to, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to come alongside each other and help one another grow and live the Christian life. It's to be holy is one of the things the church is supposed to be. Ephesians 1, 4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So God's chosen you before the world even began. So if you think it's an accident that you're here or that you're part of a church, it's not. Uh, but then... In that choosing, there's something for you to do. There's growth for to happen. Someone said it this way. Being must al always precede doing. For what we are determines what we do. Being must also always precede doing. For what we are determines what we do. In other words, just be with Jesus. The doing and what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to live, that will start to change with time. We don't make a big deal about a lot of things. Why? Because I understand the grace of God and the love of God is going to change your heart, it's going to change my life, because I struggle with things. I know you're going to struggle with things, but I get, you know what? In time, God's going to work those things in and out of us and through us for His glory and for my benefit and for our good. But it's going to take time. The other thing the church is supposed to do is to give glory to God. Ephesians 1, 5 says, He destined us in love to be His sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. We're to reflect God's glory, who He is. That's what being a Christian is. You're like, that's why I don't use that term. You know, whatever term you want to use, you're following Jesus. And so when you follow Jesus, you should reflect Jesus, right? Maybe your family is into that where you're like, you know, we are the Smiths. And so, any Smiths? Okay. Uh, yeah. Just in case. <laughs> and, and so there's an expectation as a smith, this is how we will act when we go out in public. This is how we will be when you go to college. Because you will go to college if it's the last thing you do. Maybe you don't want to phrase it that way. But, uh, and, and there's certain expectations because you're in the smith family. You know, the smith people do this. The smith, you know. Okay, we get it. But guess what? In the family of God, there's certain expectations. Our goal is not to glorify a person or one another, it's to glorify God and to be reflectors of who God is. That's part of holiness, giving glory to God, letting His light shine in and through us. It's making visible the invisible God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, we declare the character of Christ in us. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4.1, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Another walk as a Christian. Like, not like an Egyptian. <laughs> walk as a Christian. You, there's a way that that's supposed to happen, but if you don't know that, that's okay. That's why we study God's Word, so you understand and you begin to learn what that looks like. And then you begin to walk it, and it's, it's a walk. Why? Because there's a certain pace. There's a certain movement that's required in our lives. But there's no hurry. It's not a run. It's, it's a race of a lifetime. You're not going to get to a point where I'm good. I, I'm as good as I'm going to be, and that's it. Uh, no. That means you're pretty full of pride, so God's got some more chipping to do. The other thing the church is supposed to do, among other things, we could go on, but is to be a witness. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Did you know that? You're princes and princesses. A holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. See, there's a misconception in our world, especially America, that everyone's Christian. Maybe not so much today, right? Probably a lot less today than it used to be. But there's that idea that, oh, we're American, so of course we're Christian. Yeah. Well, no. Once you were not a people. It means there's a place and a point in time where you didn't follow God, you didn't love Jesus, you didn't know Him, and then you become His son, His daughter, and you move from death to life. He says, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So because you're a prince, because you're a princess, you're a child of the King, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, you've accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, 
We're to be witnesses. We're to tell people, you got the greatest news ever. They're like, have you ever told anyone? No. What? You've got the, if you had a million dollars to give out, it was just extra money. Like, who has a million dollars extra money? But, uh, and you never gave it out because it's mine, man. You know, you've got a problem because it's just extra. It's like chump change for you. You've got the greatest thing in the world to happen to you. You've got eternal life, abundant life in Jesus, forgiveness of sins. Guilt is washed away. Grace is poured out to you. Love is given to you. And you're like, I don't want to tell anyone because what if they don't accept? What if they, what if they just live for Christ and say to God in the morning, Hey, God, you could do that. Hey, God. He's not offended if you don't have the right terms, right? It's not, Thou holy, gracious Father. You know, you just talk to him. And, and then you say, hey, today, as I go to school, as I'm at work, wherever I'm going, can you, if you want to, <laughs> give me the opportunity to talk to someone today? He's like, all right, yeah. And then someone will sit beside you at lunch or at a restaurant or wherever, and they'll ask you a question, and you'll be like, oh, I know the answer. You know, it's Jesus. We're to be a witness. Greg Laurie says this, I found the happiest Christians are the evangelistic ones. I found the unhappiest Christians are the nitpicky ones. Share your faith more. <laughs> the more we just let it out, the better we go, right? Because you've got a great message to give. You're like, I don't know too much to just give what you know and then study to know more. Uh, ooh, that's tricky. Yeah, that's how it works. You're like, okay, so the church does all these great things. We're supposed to be holy, supposed to be giving glory to God. We're supposed to be a witness, but do I really need to go to church? I mean, really? There's so many churches, and they're full of hypocrites. Welcome. Uh, a hypocrite is what? It's someone who says something and does something else, right? So in a certain sense, we should all just say, yep, there's a little bit of that in me, because my intentions are this, but at times I do this. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 that's what he talked about. He says, there's things I do, I don't want to do, but I keep doing them. It's a lot of do, do. It's not good. But here's the thing. In Christ, we have the power to keep walking and moving forward. So should we go to church? You're like, what's church? Why so many churches? What's the deal with that? Well, the Bible talks about unity. Jesus' heart for us was that we'd be one. So there are certain things we should agree about with anyone who declares Jesus. And that would be good. One pastor said this, there is something better to worship God together, be committed to worship Him together, to hear His Word together. Do not reduce church to listening to a podcast. It's so much more than that. It's community. It's worshiping with others, praying for others, hurting with others, serving others, being involved in the lives of others. When the local church works, there's nothing greater. Its power is unmistakable. Its potential is unlimited. It's able to con comfort the grieving and heal the broken, provide resources for those in need. There's so much the body of Christ, the church, can do. That's what we're going to be looking at as we get into Ephesians 4 next week. The gifts that God gives. The ways that we're supposed to use and be part of a body. Right? There's all kinds of parts in a body. But this verse, if you're thinking, well, you know, if I just get there on Easter and Christmas and church on the beer, that's all good. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's that? It says, and there's some who say, hey, I don't need to get together with Christians. The, the church isn't for me. The writer of Hebrews says, oh, you need to do that. You need to stir up one another for love and good works, to encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Sunday? <laughs> no, the day is the day where everything's going to come to a close. The end times and all these kinds of things. You're like, oh, that's kind of... Yeah, we should gather together more. <clears throat> oh. Close with this. A great composer, I'm going to butcher his name, so if you're an opera student or so, bear with me. Giacomo Puccini, or something to the effect, uh, was stricken with cancer in 1922. He was determined to write a final opera, which some consider his best, Turandot. His students implored him to rest, to save his strength, but he persisted, remarking at one point, if I do not finish my music, my students will finish it. 
1924, he was taken to Brussels to be operated on. He died there two days after his surgery. But his students did finish his final work. In 1926, the gala premiere was held in Milan, Milan under the baton of his favorite student, Arturo Toscanini. All went brilliantly that evening until they came to the point in the score where the master had been forced to put down his pen. Toscanini, his face wet with tears, stopped the production, put down his baton, turned to the audience and cried out, Thus far, the master wrote, but he died. After a few moments, his faith now wreathed in a smile, he picked up the baton and cried out again, but his disciples finished his work. Our master died, was raised from the dead, and ascended to the Father, leaving the most important task in the world for us to finish, to proclaim salvation among the nations. To do it, each one of us must commit ourselves to a living relationship with the living God. We must commit ourselves to one another as members of God's household. We must commit ourselves to know, live by, and defend God's word of truth. There's no other plan to reach the world. Jesus left the plan of the ages to reach the world in the hands of the disciples, in the hands of you, in the hands of me. You're like, yeah, but what about... And I heard this as we close. The church is not like Burger King. You're like, what? You do have hot dogs. <laughs> the church is not like Burger King, because what's their big slogan? You can have it your way. The church is more like Home Depot. You're like, huh, why? Because when you go to Home Depot, what? You've got everything you need to do the tasks that are set before you. And even there's people there with little vests on to help you figure out what you need, how much you need of those things. And then even there's people just wandering around who don't have vests, who just know stuff, who are like, hey, no, don't buy that, buy this. Why? Because they're going to help you accomplish something greater than you can do by yourself. And they've got the tools for the job. That's kind of like the church. As we come together, and that's what we're going to look at next week as we move into Ephesians chapter 4, we gather to what? To be equipped, to understand more about who Jesus is, so our lives individually change, and we're transformed, and we can reach out to those all around us. This morning as we close, let me just ask a couple of questions. Do you know Jesus? You're like, oh, I know of Jesus. No, do you, do you know him? And there's a difference between knowledge of someone and experiencing who they are. To know Jesus is to believe that he's the Son of God, to accept that he died on the cross for your sins, and that you want to repent and turn from sin and turn to Jesus, to have life everlasting, your sins forgiven, and then you become part of the family of God, the church. Have you been baptized? We're going to go into the freezing cold water to baptize. Why? Because that's the next step. That's a, a step of obedience where you're saying, declaring to everyone, hey, it's already happened in my heart. I already believe. I already love Jesus. I want everybody to know. I'm going to identify with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Thirdly, are you part of a local church? I just happen to know of one. <laughs> uh, if you're not, you can be part of ours. There's no like form to sign. You just show up and start to hang out. And we'll like, hey, you're going to hang out more? Yeah, all right. And you can come on Wednesdays. You can come. We have Bible studies during the week for men, for women sometimes. We've got all kinds of things going on, but it's relationships with one another to worship Jesus and to grow in our faith. And so we'd invite you to that. If you're already part of a church, God bless you. Thanks for coming. How are you serving there? How are you growing there? Like, uh, good things to think about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for...